All right, so I'm gonna show you how to fill out the new RPA. Um, not gonna go over how to fill out the rest of the form. Um, there are templates um, that you can create. And I did do a training on how to create a template. So just see the SOPs if you wanna know how to create a template. Of course, it's gonna look different because it was based upon the old RPA. Um, the new RPA came out uh, just a few months ago. So um, I'm still kind of getting used to it, but I did notice um, when some of you are submitting the offers for review that there are still some items that you are not checking off um, that will definitely need to be checked off. And of course, this is going to be depending on what kind of offer that you're submitting. Um, but of course, you know, as you're filling it out, you're going to do, you know, date prepared, who the offer is from, like the buyer's name here, the, um, the property, street address, city, county, zip code, and the APN that you can find on the MLS. Um, make sure, so agency, um, these check boxes need to be checked. So Typically, what I like to do is whenever I'm creating a template, I like to do check boxes for the items that I don't have to, so the way I don't have to keep going back and, ch and changing and, or, or and checking those off. Usually, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't change unless the other, um, unless the seller is representing or is with EXP as well, then you would be checking this box for both the buyer and seller. So make sure that if you are representing a buyer and the listing agent is with EXP, you're checking off this box and of course, filling out all of this info. Um, sometimes it doesn't pull correctly from the MLS. So um, you'll just want to double check it. Please do me a favor. And before you send over the offers to review, double check it, triple check it before you send it to me. Um, so that way I'm not the one doing the triple check or the double checking, you're the one doing the double checking and then I'll be doing, you know, triple checking for you. So make sure that these items are checked off. Um, and like I said, uh, if you are just representing the buyer and the other in the seller, uh, the selling agent or not the selling agent, that's you. Um, and the listing agent isn't with EXP, this is what you would check. So, um, and then, so, of course, make sure you're also attending the contracts class. This is gonna, um, that we're actually reviewing um, the contracts this month in February, we're in February right now, um, but I'm sure they'll redo it at some point. There's also Thursdays um, where they do like a workshop to teach you how to fill it out. Um, so purchase price, obviously you're gonna put in the purchase price here. Um, all cash, if it's all cash, you would check that and you see how it makes the loan amounts go away. Because obviously if you have a, uh, all cash, you would not um, need a loan unless it's a hard money loan. And then you would just treat it as if it's a regular um, purchase. So um, close of escrow, this must be filled out or else you're, um, it's just not good to have that filled out because then there's no end date or there's no close date. So typically you're gonna put 30 days after offer, offer acceptance or say the buyer is like, hey, I really need, or the seller says that they really need a certain date. You can always put that certain date there. Just make sure that anything that you're putting that the lender is able to accommodate you on that. Um, typically 30 days they can. Usually if it's less than 30 days, they need a little bit more, like you need to just make sure that you know what the lender can do. Um, expiration of offer, usually three calendar days after all buyer signatures. Um, you can also put a different date and time in here if your client wants to do a longer period or even a shorter period. So that's what you would do for that, um, for that section. Um, and then, so if you're going to do, so say the buyer, oh, wait, I skipped this section. So initial deposit, um, you're going to put the amount in here, um, and then it'll automatically calculate the percentage within three business days, or 
um, after acceptance by wire transfer. So it's gonna be uh, standard that is by wire transfer. Um, so you can um, either do that or if the buyer wants to do it by check or money or, or like whatever is accepted, you can put um, or, but usually it's just by wire transfer. Um, and then you have five, uh, 5A2, which is the increased deposit. This is like if they want to do the initial deposit and then after a certain period of time, they want to raise that initial deposit, they can do that. I've never had a buyer do that before, but not, it's not to say that that can happen with you. So you would just check that box and then another form would pop up. So you would use the DID form um, for the time that the increased deposit is made. I'm not too familiar with this. So if this happens, we may wanna go in and talk to a broker. Um, for the loan amount. So you're gonna put the loan amount here in this section. Um, and so it just depends on what type of loan that they're doing. You're gonna calculate that out and put that amount here. Um, if they're using a VA loan, um, that's just gonna be, um, so if they're gonna do like 500,000 for their um, offer price, you would just put 500,000 there. Um, and then let's see if they were going to do a fixed rate, you would put that amount not to exceed. Um, if they're gonna pay points, you would put the percentage of the points that they're gonna do there. And then you're also going to put the loan contingency um, length and um, actually, no, they're not putting the loan contingency link. So if it's an FHA or VA, you're gonna, um, so this is a different form that we'll have to deliver. So we just have to deliver them a list of lender required repairs. We would do that 17 days after acceptance or you can modify it there. Um, I would modify it if you had like a much shorter um, escrow period, like if it's shorter than 17 days, Obviously, you're going to want to change that to like 15 days or whatever it is. Um, and then make sure that if it is an FHA or VA or seller financing or other, I've never used those two. So I don't know what those, are, you know, it, obviously there's other things that you can do. Um, for VA, you know, you want to check that FHA. And then there's another form that will pop up whenever you select those two. So just make sure that you're filling out that form too. It's the FEAC form. Um, that has, uh, that would need to be submitted with the offer um, or even after the offer is accepted, but it definitely needs to uh, be in there. Um, E2 additional, so this is if there's an additional loan. I've never used this section either. Um, occupancy type, um, standard, it's primary. Um, if it's secondary or an investment, you can check one of those. Um, and then we're going to scroll down here to seller credit, if any, to buyer. So if there's a, a credit that this buyer is willing, wanting to ask for, then this is the section that you put it in. And then seller credit to be applied to closing costs or other. So you can, like if there was a situation where they wanted it other than closing, maybe to like repairs or something like that. Uh, G2, so if you're going to use an escalation clause, you put it there in G2. H1, verification of all cash. Um, so this is uh, three days. Verification of down payment and closing costs, that's the EMD. So that's the initial deposit that we put up here uh, in this section in D1. Um, so that's what that would be for. Um, Verification of loan application. This is just for their pre-approval. Typically three days after acceptance, uh, or it's typically attached to the offer. Or you can do it three days after acceptance. Nobody ever does that in this market. Um, but then make sure that you're selecting pre-approval or if it's fully un underwritten, you can also check that box. So it just depends on if you have a, a it's called a DU. Um, I think it's called desktop underwriting, right? David is saying yes. Um, so I always get that wrong. I always call it direct underwriting. <laughs> um, but if they do have that, then you can select that box right there. Um, that's going to be your strongest one because that means that they've already, um, they pretty much have already looked at the file. 
uh, verification or final verification of condition five days prior to closing, or you can modify it to be longer or shorter. Um, I would just leave it as is. Um, assignment request 17 days after acceptance, you can modify that as well. Um, here are the contingencies. So for loan, it actually used to be 21 days for loan. They shorten it to 17 days. So you can either um, make it longer or shorter, depending on what your client wants to do. I wouldn't recommend longer because it's you know a seller's market. So, um, or if they're removing their loan contingency, you check this box right here. If you are removing any contingencies, uh, the, C, the contingency removal form needs to be checked off right here. And then the form actually needs to be filled out. Um, if there's an appraisal contingency minimum that they're willing to do, you can put the amount in here. Um, if they're wanting to make it shorter, you can put it in this box. And of course, no appraisal contingency there. And then you would do the CR form. And so you can do one CR form, depending on if you're removing one or three, um, because you can remove all three. Uh, investigation property. Um, so you can shorten that for all of these for a review of seller documents, the prelim and common interest disclosures, like if they're in a condo or a townhome. Review of lease or lien items is usually solar uh, panels. Um, if they have a, if the buyer needs to sell their property in order to buy this one, you would uh, check this box and the COP form would pop up. Um, so contingency of purchase. Um, so then that would pop up and then you would fill out that form. Um, I'm just going to select these so the way they pop up, so the way I can show you how to fill those out. Let me actually go back up here to select the year. Um, time of possession. So uh, they actually changed this too, which, which is great. So upon notice of re recording, so Ascar will let you know whenever it's recorded, or they can select their certain, um, certain times that they want to be able to take possession. So they could select 9 a.m. or 6 p.m., whatever they want to do. Um, seller occupied or vacant units, um, COE date or below. So if they're going to do a lease back, this is where the, you would check the box for either one that they're wanting to do. And then either the SIP form will be attached or the RLS it will be attached if it's 30 more days, 30 or more days. Tenant occupied, um, you can, if it's tenant occupied, then you would check that box or um, other if attached. So, um, and then of course the seller has certain times that they need to um, deliver the documents. So uh, seven days for, or seven days after acceptance, five for escrow instructions, uh, HOA fees, three days, seven days for carbon monoxide uh, smoke detector. You don't have to check any of these or do anything unless you're shortening it or making it longer. Um, and then you want to select items excluded and included. So talk to your client about like what they want to do um, because uh, they'll have to check off these boxes for anything that they're wanting to do as far as what's included versus excluded. So just make sure you talk to them about that. And of course, don't select anything that the home actually doesn't have. Um, so, and then if there's additional items, you can check that. If you know, um, like in the MLS, if it's like, do not, absolutely do not ask for the water softener and you put excluded water softener. And it just makes the um, listing agent's life a little bit easier. So that way they don't have to counter you back if you are asking for items that they don't want to include. So it's just good practice. Um, natural hazard, you'll do seller and then you'll select environmental and then make sure to select provided by and then just put seller's choice in here. So. You got seller to choose or seller's choice or seller's choice of company, whatever you fancy, just don't leave it blank. Um, and then if, you know, you could always put um, in here, uh, termite clearance to be provided by seller, but I'd leave that up to negotiations. Credo four, you're gonna do seller to pay, seller to pay for a few five, seller, Escrow fees, you're going to do each to pay their own fees. 
Escrow holder, again, is seller's choice. Or if the listing agent is telling you something specific, you can always put that in there. But typically, we just allow the seller to choose. Um, title, in, uh, title insurance policy, seller, again, seller's choice. Seller's choice of company, seller to choose, whichever one. Um, I usually just select county, city, unless of course it's Redondo Beach. If it's Redondo Beach, then both split 50-50. Um, HOA fees usually, like transfer fees and stuff are usually paid by the seller. So you can select seller, we'll pay that. Um, private transfer fees. Um, usually just leave that blank. Um, home warranty plan. Uh, you can say like if the seller, if you're asking for the seller to pay for it, check that box, cost not to exceed a certain amount, and then do issue by like just depending on what the buyer wants to do. If you're not sure what the buyer wants to do, you can either select one for them or you can put buyer's choice of company. Um, and then, of course, you can make additional notes in here like buyer to choose um, options which allows then for your buyer to choose any options that they want. So say you have a home warranty company that um, it doesn't include like refrigerator or whatever, um, you can have that your buyer can choose that. So um, any other terms? So if there's any type of other things that are doing like EMD to be non-refundable or um, anything that isn't above, that's where you put it on section R for other terms. And then just if you're going through, just make sure you're looking through the section and make sure that, um, compare this to the MLS and make sure that you're not supposed to select any of these. Cause like if it's an REO or if it's in a trust, um, probate, anything like that, you'll wanna check those boxes. And then again, any boxes that you check have a form that pops up. Um, if you're going to fill out a specific addendum, of course, you would select this and then, you know, you have to fill out the addendum for it. But there's a box in everything for like anything that you're filling out in the offer. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to cover the rest of it because it's pretty standard. And this is the most important section. And there's a there's a reason for each checkbox. And so um, that's also why I'm kind of a um, contract Nazi, because if you don't check a box, it means that you have now made it so the way your client can not get whatever you didn't check. So say, say you forgot to check like natural hazard disclosures um, for environmental, um, then your client doesn't get the environmental. And then, you know, you, we would have to figure out what in the world happens after that. And most likely, like you would want to, you know, pay for the additional cost of it if you didn't ask for it and you were supposed to. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, ramifications if there's certain check boxes that aren't checked and certain forms that aren't filled out correctly. So let's see if I can go back and, and show you. No, I don't want to save those changes. Okay, those didn't pop up. So um, let me just do... I don't really want to do new. All right, whatever. Um, but I don't want to do that. Let me go. I don't know. I can just uh, let's do purchases. Um, I just don't want to confuse anything. I just do that on a buyer representation. <laughs> Um, so let's go to documents and then I don't know why I couldn't get back to the other forms where it just brings up regular forms anyways. Um, okay, so the FBAC. So it's the FB or FHA VA mandatory clause. So for this, um, Always, always, always at the top of a form, you're gonna to wanna to fill out what kind of form it is that you're responding to and what this form is attached to, and then the date of that form that you're pertaining to here. Not this form, but whatever form you're doing. So like purchase agreement, say it was dated today, um, then that's what you would do and then fill out the seller's info. 
And then if they're purchasing it for 700, you fill out the 700 there and then send that out to them for signature. Just make sure you're um, filling that out. And then I didn't say this, but you definitely want to go back and like read all of the forms that you're sending out to your clients just so the way you get a better understanding. So I would read it like quite a few times because every time I read it, I always, uh, always learn something new every time I read it. Um, so we had the FBIC, um, COP, I'll show you, contingency for sale of buyer's property. And then you would be filling this one out. So purchase agreement, of course, date, fill out seller buyers, uh, uh, seller's info, buyer's property. So what property it is that they need to sell. If, if it's a contingent sale, this is only for if a buyer needs to sell their property in order to buy. Um, and then whether or not they have a contract or only the close or by entering into a contract for the sale and closing on the buyer's property, only entering into a contract for the sale or only the close of escrow of buyer's property. If it's already an escrow, you put the escrow name, escrow number, um, and whether or not the form will be delivered to the seller within two days after acceptance or longer or shorter. Um, and these are all options you would give to your client. So you don't have to fill these out or figure these out on your own. This is also for the buyer um, to figure out. So buyers shall have 17 days after acceptance to enter into a contract. Um, you can make that longer or shorter. Um, and then if it's in MLS, MLS status, um, wait, um, Sorry, this form is just complicated. Uh, so this is if it, the listing still needs to be signed and entered into a contract. Um, close of buyer's property, how many days prior? Or, oh, so this is for if the buyer wants to cancel, depending on whether or not they can find a property. Um, sales status, um, buyer, let's see, one, two, three. Contingencies. Oh, this is like if they give them notice, just keep it at two days. It doesn't need to be longer than that. Um, if buyer's property is in or enters in escrow. So this is for if either party wants to cancel, it gives them two days. Um, so let's see. So we'll just have a talk about this form whenever it comes to it, because it's very, very complicated. So I don't want to tell you what to fill out um, without knowing like the specific situation. Um, so let's just talk about this form if you do need to fill it out. So anyway, it's probably confused you to death, but I confuse myself to death too, because it's just a complicated form. So just let me know like if you do have a buyer that you're helping buy that, that also needs to sell their property. Um, and then the other form was the RLAS and the SIP. So residential lease after sales, the RLAS. Um, and so you wanna fill out like when you, um, like everything needs to be filled out on these forms that's in yellow. Um, for the most part. Um, they don't have to necessarily pay for the lease back. That needs to be negotiated. So like lease back amount and, and um, security deposit, all of that needs to be negotiated and presented. Um, if it's upon acceptance, then obviously you want to do that upon acceptance. Um, but usually you want to offer like what the actual, like if they're offering a free one, then you don't have to do this. They don't care about security deposit. Then you still have to do this form. You just don't have to do anything on it. You don't have to fill it out per se. Um, let's see, parking, uh, utility. So like all of the stuff would need to be filled out. And again, this is kind of a more complicated form. So, and it's very, very long. That's why I usually don't have my agents fill it out until after it's accepted. Um, because they're not even, you're not even going to necessarily know like some things like how many keys they have to the property. Like there's no way to know that as you're placing the offer. 
So you can always just offer at least like, okay, if you're having them pay the rent at the buyer's PITI, you can put that um, in the offer itself for the security deposit amount as well. Um, but other than that, it's like, it's kind of complicated to fill this out from the get-go. So that's why I usually say it's negotiated upon acceptance. And then you just want to do that once you get an offer accepted. And then the same thing for the SIP. SIP is less than 30 days. So if it's 29 days or, or less, that's when you would use a SIP um, instead of an RLAS. But these forms, um, you know, they, they do have to be executed. So, you know, if you don't do it while you're submitting um, the offer, then you're definitely gonna have to do it like right as, after you have acceptance. So the way, like, at least do it during the buyer's inspection contingency window, because like, if you can't come to an agreement with the seller, um, then at least the buyer can back out. So, but anyways, I think that's all I wanted to cover. Um, the main point I wanted to get at was just making sure that you're filling out the RPA correctly and the RIPA. Um, RIPA differs a little bit. Let me, oh look, now I'm back to the form. Um, RIPA gonna differ slightly. Let's see initial deposit. Yeah. I mean, because it's going to have the tenant estoppels and stuff in here. So it's going to differ in that regard. Um, and then it also differs with items included and excluded because the, the, the seller, which is the landlord, because they usually don't live there. And of course you're not gonna live in more than one unit because this is for two to four units. And um, so if, yeah. So yeah, the, usually the tenants own the, the appliances. Sorry, I kind of got off track. Um, I was trying to think through it. Um, but yeah, typically the tenants own the appliances. So typically you don't ask for those things and you just bring your own and then the tenants have their own as well. So, um, that's going to differ. Um, like I said, the tenant estoppels, but pretty much everything else is kind of the same. So like tenant estoppel cer certificate, and then of course this section as well. So, but that's what I wanted to cover. If you do not have templates, you definitely need to make them. And so if you have no idea how to do that, I do have an SOP on that, like I said in the beginning. Um, so check that out so that when you create those templates, it's gonna save you a lot of time. It's gonna save me a lot of time. Um, I hate having to go back through and correcting you on the same thing over again. So if you could make all of our lives easier and just create those templates, um, it's definitely going to make your life easier. So the way you don't have to send me, um, well, you have to send me the offer for review if you're a junior buyer's agent. Um, but if, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just going to make your life so much easier once you do those templates. So, um, but yeah, so hopefully this was helpful. If there's anything I missed, just let me know. If you have any questions, let me know as well.